I've got a question for you this morning, and it's, it's a little bit of a painful question, but um, I'm willing to do that once in a while with, with you guys. Are you guys really willing to kind of wrestle with a painful topic? Uh, uh, here's the question. Are you a fool? Am I a fool? Well, don't answer that. This is a personal thing, you know. This is, this is where you're supposed to think only of yourself at this moment. Are you a fool? Am I a fool? Or are you what would the Bible would call the wise? Are, are you wise or are you foolish? Now, it's funny. This is a tricky question because it depends on what mode you're in. Uh, some of you might immediately say, I'm not a fool. Of course not. Uh, I know a lot of fools and I'm not one. It's amazing when you kind of think about it, um, you know, like um, people, think of, the, think of a person, oh, like say, uh, um, you know, a celebrity or someone who's a politician that you totally disagree with. Think about that for a second. Someone who you totally disagree with. And, 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 and the thing is, you probably think, well, they're a total fool. Uh, but what's interesting, if that person were, you know, sitting right here next to me on the stool, um, like if I'm, if I'm thinking of a politician that I disagree with and, and I had her sit right here on this, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, what are you laughing at? What are you laughing at? Um, sorry. And, I, I, and she sat right here and we talked. I, I would think she was a fool, but she would also equally think I was a fool. That's the truth of the matter. She would say, you're a total fool. Um, isn't that interesting that two people could think of each other as total and complete fools? And the problem is, how do we know who's right? Um, that's a hard question to answer. And, and I'll tell you, just using your own brain, well, that's not a great idea. And I'll tell you why. Because you might just be a fool and you'll be the last one to know it. Um, that's what Solomon's going to talk about. But the idea of being the, the wise person versus the foolish person well, Jesus talks about the same theme that Solomon's gonna talk about. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter seven and let's see what Jesus says about the wise man and the foolish man. Uh, and this is what we kind of have to look at. It's Matthew seven and we'll begin there in verse 24. You guys know this. It's, it's something we've heard perhaps in your lifetime. Uh, in Matthew seven, Jesus wraps up the Sermon on the Mount. It's, it's the most red letters in the Bible. If you look at Matthew chapter seven, chapter six, chapter five, <clears throat> it's the red letter section because it's the Sermon on the Mount. And then Jesus wraps it up. And, and, and in fact, look at verse 24. He says, therefore, now pause. Whenever you see the word therefore, you have to see what it's there for. Why is the word therefore there? And the answer is because he's wrapping up the Sermon on the Mount, kind of summing it up, um, which is kind of important. So he wraps up the Sermon on the Mount, verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, Sermon on the Mount, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Some of you, you know, working in construction, you know that man, your building is only gonna be as good as the foundation it sits upon. And that's why, you know, those of you that build, you know that it's gotta be usually a lot of steel and a lot of concrete and some footings that are beefy. Otherwise, the house could fall off the cliff or sink into the ground or crack in half. And there's all kinds of problems that happens when you don't have a firm foundation. They knew that in Bible times. I love that Jesus is using an analogy that would go on through the ages that works for thousands of years. But those of you that maybe aren't into building, some of you have stood on the beach have you ever been standing on the beach, you know, and it's, it kind of feels cool when your feet are in the sand and you're there right where the waves start to, you know, splash against the, the shore there. And, and, you know, when the water comes, you feel the sand sort of whirring out under, from underneath you, your, your feet sinking into the sand. And it's kind of a fun feeling if it's just you, but if it's your house, you got a problem. Your house is sinking in the sand and that's the thing. You know, there's people that build their houses, their lives is the idea, on shifting, sinking sand. Um, that's the foolish person. 
The wise man builds his house upon the rock. Jesus is comparing wise man and the foolish man. And he sums it up right there. That's really what Solomon's gonna do in Ecclesiastes. He's gonna, he's gonna give us, you and I, sort of a, a few things as sort of a litmus test to see how you and I are doing. Are we the foolish man or woman? Are we the wise man or the wise woman? Well, let's take a look. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 10. And here, Solomon's gonna give us the test. Now, by the way, Solomon's an expert on both because he was given God-given wisdom. We know that from the Bible. And people came from all over the world to hear Solomon's wisdom. The problem, much of Solomon's life, he chose to use foolishness as his his motive, his method. Um, And he knows that he was the fool. And so he's an expert on both. He's perhaps the wisest man that ever walked the face of the earth, according to the Bible, except for Jesus. But at the same time, he lived as foolishly as it gets. The, The point, you can be wise, but you might be not using the wisdom you were given and you walk in foolishness. Solomon's an expert on both of these. And so he speaks with authority about wise man, foolish man, right here in Ecclesiastes chapter 10. And so how the foolish man and the wise man, well, there's things that you can look to your life, to your situation to see how you're doing. Let's take a look. Here in chapter 10, we're gonna look at the first 15 verses this morning, and we'll see four things that sort of test us a little bit. Number one, it goes right here in verse one. Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly or foolishness, him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart at his left. Yea, also when he that is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom fails him. And he says to everyone that he is a fool. Verses one through three speak of the first thing, and we're gonna, we're gonna call this live their life. How the foolish man or the wise man, how they live their life, this is how you can test and see if you're a wise man or a foolish man, how you live your life. That's number one. Uh, now, this is interesting because, uh, you know, he uses the word folly here in verse one, but you know what's interesting is the idea of the fool's heart or the fool. What is a fool? Since we're talking about foolishness, um, I was looking it up in the dictionary. And um, there's three main definitions given in the dictionary and they get from sort of of calm and chill to a little more intense to kind of more what a fool really is. Let me give you the three. Number one definition, one who's deficient in judgment, sense or understanding. That's a nice way of putting it. Deficient in uh, judgment, sense or understanding. Number two, one who acts unwisely, excuse me, on a given occasion. Um, But the third definition is the one that's a little more prickly. It says this, one who's been tricked or made to appear ridiculous, a dupe. We need to bring that word dupe back. That's a good word right there. What a dupe. Um, The dupe implies someone who's been tricked, which means there's someone who's trying to trick you. Now, this is where the Hebrew word for fool in the original text of the Old Testament It lines up with definition number three of the Webster's Dictionary more than the other two. The other nice ones, well, the the dupe thing where you've been tricked or made to appear ridiculous, that's the same thing as the Hebrew word that's defined here as Solomon uses the word fool. Now, I'm one, I love thesauruses. I like looking up, you know, the synonyms uh, of words because that almost gives you a better sense of the word. And I looked up the word fool and I was shocked. There's hundreds of words that are uh, synonymous with fool. Uh, I think we've learned how to insult each other really well. Uh, There's lots of words, uh, but I'll give you uh, 10 of my favorite. Are you ready? Uh, A buffoon, an imbecile. An idiot, bird brain, bonehead, dimwit, lame brain, moron, nincompoop. <laughs> There's another name, uh, nincompoop. We should bring that one back. But th- don't be a nincompoop. The Bible says, don't be a fool. And um, these are the synonyms of the word fool. And Satan wants to make you look like a buffoon, dimwit, lame brain, like all that stuff that's synonymous with fool. That's what Satan wants to do. He wants to make a fool out of you and me. And he wants to use his trickery to do it. 
And so Solomon here is trying to give us a, a litmus test of life. And, and the first thing is how you live your life. Do you live as a fool or do you live as a wise person? Notice here how they live their life. The fool, the problem is there's a stink that goes uh, along with it. That's what Solomon says. He, he speaks of the dead fly in the ointment. Hmm. What is that all about? Well, last week, if you were studying with us, we talked about the precious ointment and um, you know how a good name is better than precious ointment. We, and we talked about the value and what precious ointment was, but that valuable precious ointment could be ruined by a dead fly. Um, and you have to understand, you know, some of the perfumes and the ointments of Bible days, they didn't have quite the same technology to seal uh, the, 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 the jar or the bottle or the box that would hold the precious ointment. And so if a fly were to get in there, the problem is the fly would start to make the ointment go bad. They didn't have quite the same ability to preserve some of the ointments and they would start to stink. Solomon, the implication that he's trying to show us is that the person is still using the ointment and doesn't realize that it stinks. There's, there's a stink. They're, they're putting on in the morning. What do you ladies do? I don't know how you do that. You know, I was just gonna uh, dab a little bit here and there. Some of you, I think, are kind of more like this. But, um, uh, but, but uh, you, you think it smells good because you paid good money for it. And, it and, and, and slowly but surely, the fly in the ointment made it to stink. And Solomon's saying, you're putting on the ointment, but it's just a little folly, a little foolishness makes the whole thing stink. That's the image or imagery that Solomon is employing here. Notice his phrase. He says, dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking smell. So doth, look at this, a little folly, him that is uh, in reputation for wisdom and honor. He's talking about a person who has a reputation for wisdom and honor, but just the little fly in the ointment, a little folly can make the whole thing stink. Isn't that true? There's people who've acted wisely and done great things and been honorable men and honorable women for the most part, but one dumb decision, one deed or one act can ruin you for life and cause the stink that the Bible's talking about here. And how you live your life, letting just a little folly in, and that's the problem. The enemy wants you to compromise and, and edge your way in to just folly. What's folly? Sin doing that which is contrary to what God's word tells us to do. Um, you know, embracing worldly sinful things and, and just thinking, oh, it's just a little thing, nobody's gonna notice. But it says that it's like a dead fly in the ointment. Um, man, it's interesting because how you live your life. If you're, uh, notice verse two, it, it says, a wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left hand. Now this isn't a political statement. Some of you, I know you'd love to make this your political mantra. Um, but you gotta understand, there's, there's a sort of a thing here that uh, again, we sort of miss in our culture to a degree, um, but that is if you're a lefty. If you were a lefty in Bible times, it was a tricky thing because the worldview at the time was, was really kind of brutal. If you were left-handed, people thought there was something wrong with you. And there's actually ancient writings about lefties who chose to be righties because they didn't want to be deemed. Well, they literally said that you were not only like physically handicapped if you were left-handed, but they would even associate it with mentally handicapped if you were left-handed. It was a, a brutal kind of environment to be a lefty back in Bible days. So oftentimes soldiers would learn to use their right hand instead of their left just to cover up that they were lefties. Um, and because uh, it was so embarrassing. And like that was the kind of the culture of the day. And uh, so you kind of have to get around that today. But the idea of the right hand and the left, one of the things in the Bible, because that was the worldview, the Lord employs that imagery. You, and it doesn't matter as much right hand or left hand, but what is your stronger hand? Um, you know, for some of you, your stronger hand is your left hand. And the, the verse here, verse, verse two, a, a wise man's heart is at his right hand. One of the things the Bible says as an idiom is right hand always speaks of the strength. And, um, and so, you know, uh, you know the, the phrase, you know, he's the son of my right hand. That means he's the son of my strength. The disciples asked Jesus, can we sit at your, you know, your right hand? And Jesus is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. There's an imagery there of strength. The left hand, you don't wanna say, you're the son of my left hand. That means you're my weak son. Uh, it was an insulting thing to say that. So it's not as much about right and left. It's more about where do you gravitate? What, what does your life gravitate toward? Does it, does it go more toward the strength, the things that make you stronger? 
or does it gravitate toward the things that make you weaker? And it, it, it's, it's the test for foolishness because foolishness, you'll be drawn to things that make you weak and, and it's part of the deal. You say, well, Brett, what, what are you talking about? What kind of stuff? Well, you know, man, the list is long. Anything that's sinful, anything that's contrary to what the Lord tells us, even as Jesus said, man, if you do these words of mine and hear what I said, um, then you're gonna be on, built on a rock. But if you go against and you don't hear and you don't do what I tell you, then you're gonna be building your house on a sand. It's the same imagery. So you have to ask yourself, is what I'm doing right now making me stronger or weaker? Spiritually uh, is the main thing there. You know, the people that you hang out with, the places you go, the stuff you put into your brain and fill your soul on TV or with music or, you know, on your iPhone or whatever. Is it making you stronger spiritually or is it making you weaker? The fool tends to gravitate toward the things that make them weaker and blow off whatever the consequences. That's the foolish person. So you got the, the, the little bit of folly that makes the whole thing stink You've got the person who gravitates toward the weak stuff that makes them weak. But verse three, um, it says, he that is a fool walks by the way, his wisdom fails him and he saith to everyone that he's a fool. Now, the, some of your newer translation get it perhaps a little closer in the sense that when it says, it says to everyone that he's a fool, it, it, the word could be show. He, he shows everyone that he's a fool, but the idea, he's the last one to know about it. He doesn't realize he's walking around like a fool and everybody knows he's a fool, but he somehow thinks he's pulling it off. Even though people are like, whew, that stinks. Whew, that guy's going toward his weakness and he's walking around thinking he's dialed in, but at the same time, he's a total fool. You know, it's, it's one of the more difficult, sad things to see when a person starts doing things with their life that everybody can see how foolish it is. Um, there's a lot of examples and probably some of them are too close to home. So I'm gonna talk about something maybe that hopefully nobody's doing right now, just for an illustration. The midlife crisis man. You know what I'm talking about? The 45, 50 year old guy, you know, he's been married for years. He's got a beautiful family and a faithful wife. But for some reason, he kind of goes into that midlife crisis mode and pretty soon he dumps his old wife for a younger, more, you know, improved uh, version, so he thinks. And he gets the sports car and, and he starts wearing the butterfly collar and the gold chain and slicks back his hair. Um, and, uh, and he's like, hey baby, and suddenly he's like the cool. <laughs> and, and he thinks he looks cool to everybody, but everybody's like, <laughs> like, like, because <laughs> it's just this horrible, grotesque scene of this guy trying to be cool when he really had something beautiful over here something that is actually wisdom and right, the family, the wife that was uh, amazing and, and the wife of his youth as the Bible calls her. Um, but the guy somehow thought life would be better, that he was doing the right thing by going and you know, shifting to this midlife crisis mode. And the thing about that, he's the last guy in the world to know how lame it really looks, how the fly in the ointment made the whole thing stink and he thinks he's hip and cool. That's just one example. I could get, get more you know, exacting perhaps for a lot of the things that people, that we have a tendency to do. But that's what Solomon's saying. The fool, the problem is he's the last one to realize he's behaving foolishly and, and everybody else can smell it. Everybody else can see it except for him. That's the idea here. So that's the problem. Uh, maybe you don't even know. Maybe you don't even realize. That's, that's the argument. So the way that you live your life, the fool doesn't realize that he stinks. He thinks he's able to cover it up. The wise man, however, gravitates towards things that make him stronger to do better. That's the, the, the way he nails it down, the way they live their life. So how the foolish man and the wise man live their life, number one. Number two, <clears throat> how the foolish man and the wise man look at leadership. <clears throat> to keep the L's going, to help us remember these things. How, how do you look at leadership? That will determine whether you're a fool or a wise man, wise woman. What do you mean, look at leadership? Well, how do you view those that are in authority over you? Because Solomon's gonna give us that in verse four. He says, if the spirit of the ruler, the leader, <clears throat> rise up against thee, leave not thy place for 
yielding pacifieth great offenses. Uh, I love what the New International Version puts it. It makes it a little easier there in verse four. If a ruler's anger rises against you, do not leave your post. Calmness can lay great errors to rest. Do you wanna lay your errors to rest? That's like a good plan? Yeah. So what do you do? Well, when a leader or a ruler rises up against you, rather than being defensive and get mad at them, hold your, hold your tongue, keep to your post, don't move, don't go, don't leave your place, but yield. For yielding pacifieth <clears throat> great offenses. Verse five, <clears throat> there's an evil which I have seen under the sun as an error which proceedeth from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity and the rich sit in a low place. I have seen servants upon horses and princes walking as servants upon the earth. Solomon, who was high and mighty, he was a king, powerful, wealthy. You guys know all that. We've been talking about Solomon now for weeks. Um, but he said, you know, all that's way overrated. I've seen rulers walking in the dirt. I've seen slaves riding high up on a horse. So be careful in thinking that you have certain status or thinking more highly of yourself than you should. And, and, the, and the context here is what happens when someone in authority comes and speaks against you, what do you do? What do you do? The foolish man, frustrated when a person of high position or power or authority starts to judge them or speak against them, the foolish man reacts. The wise man responds and tries to be a peacemaker and, and sometimes even holds their tongue and doesn't say anything. You know, it's interesting. Um, um, there's times where we have this knee-jerk reaction. And it starts when we're children with our parents, our parents who are in, uh, in fact authority. Uh, you'll know when a kid uh, is a fool or headed for a foolish adulthood when they never are taught by their parents that, you know, we need to submit to authority. Um, mom and dad, if you're trying to be your child's buddy and you don't wanna you know, uh, challenge them in some things that, from times, um, they're gonna not learn how to respect authority. That's one of the biggest goofs parents make, I think, with their children because they're raising little fools to not know how to submit to their manager, their teacher, their principal, their coach, uh, their boss, uh, and, and other forms of, of authority. No matter who you are, you're gonna have people in authority. I've noticed that some of you, you know, if, if I talk to you right now about the last time you were pulled over by a police officer, how did you react? How did you respond? And I've noticed there's two kinds of people. There's the person like me who I, I've found it really helpful um, the many, many times I've been pulled over um, <laughs> um, just to be nice and, and, and totally submitted to the police officer. He's law enforcement. See, the, my worldview comes from Romans 13 where the Bible says that the man who wields the sword uh, and the idea of, of uh, whether it's a soldier or a police officer, the Bible says he is a minister of God for you. And if you've done sinful wrong stuff, be afraid. But if you've done right, don't be afraid, but still submit to that authority. That authority is of God. Read Romans 13, the first half of that chapter talks about that. So my view is when a police officer pulls me over, not only do I probably deserve it, he doesn't even know how bad it really is. I, I, I almost feel good once in a while getting pulled over like, oh man, it's time, yeah, I need to slow down and I do like driving fast. It's just kind of fun for me and Lord forgive me and it's, I'll take the ticket and, and I'll even thank the officer. Thank you, you know, officer, appreciate you, you know, keeping things safe out here. And now, now they might think I'm just trying to, you know, gain favor with them and the answer to that is yes. Um, but I've got a bunch of friends over the years that say, yeah, a police officer pulled me over the other day and I told him, what did you, what did you pull me over for? What do you think you're, and, and thinking that arguing is somehow gonna help the situation. Um, there are whole groups of people in our culture, in our nation that, that hate police officers so much that their parents are training them to resist, um, which is actually illegal. <laughs> you're not supposed to resist. Uh, law enforcement, uh, but people are teaching our, our, our kids to do that and it's causing all kinds of trouble in our nation. Um, the Bible teaches the foolish man resists that authority. 
uh, those that are in authority over you, whether it's parents or whatever. And I'm amazed at how we see a lot of foolishness just in this area. How do you look at those that are in leadership in authority over you? And you know, um, the thing is, uh, if you're one who thinks you have a right to argue and all that stuff, you might wanna rethink that. The Bible kind of seems to call that foolishness. And especially if you're one who's kind of high and mighty. You see, that's what verses five, six, and seven are about. The person who's the slave up on the horse and the ruler, the king, or whatever that's walking on the dirt. The point is, it doesn't matter who you are, whatever position you have, you still need to be a person who's willing to submit to authority. And I, I hope you have people that you submit yourself to Human nature, sinful nature, is that which tries to say, you know what, you're not the boss of me, I'm the boss of myself. Don't, you can't tell me what to do. And, and people get all up in a tizzy about someone giving you advice or giving you direction or even being an authority. Some of you will not have a person be the authority over you. And I believe that's the life of the fool. If that's you, you're behaving foolishly. You need to seek out someone to submit yourself to or a group of people to submit yourself to. Um, you know, if you're a married person, you need to submit to your husband, to your wife. Oh no, bread, it says wives submit to your husbands. Read your Bibles, people. The verse before it says wives submit to your husbands says submit yourselves one to another, first and foremost. And that's why Debbie and I, we submit ourselves one to another. We start there. And, and you know, not to, I mean, one of the things I risk sounding weird on this one, but um, you know, there's churches that take this too far where they try to control people. There's, there's actually weird churches, denominations that say, if, you go, if you're planning on moving, you have to run that by your pastor. Can we move to Sherwood? No. Like who's gonna do that? There's, there's churches, there's denominations that they are that legalistic and weird. However, it is funny because um, in the Bible, church leadership should have a certain area of authority in, in people's lives. That's what the Bible teaches. Pastors, you know, elders, leadership. But I've noticed in our culture, it's like, yeah, whatever, blow all that off. And you know, you guys just stay out of our lives and stuff. And you know, it's, it's funny because I do, I, I'm not pushing my leadership into anybody's face, but you know, it's, it, it's interesting. People come and they wanna have counsel. And, uh, and so I'll, I'll say, here's what the Bible says and here's what you need to do. And, and if they don't like it, they're like, you're not the boss of me. It's just funny to me. Uh, like there's this, there's this rebellious spirit within humanity that's very sinful. And sadly, any of us, if we're not submitted to someone particularly or a group of people, um, you're a fool. This is the fool test. When a ruler rises up or someone in authority says, you know, this or that to you and you argue with them, man, respect is the key rather than Resistance, that, that's the foolish man, the wise man, how you view, how you look at leadership. So how the foolish man lives their life, the wise man lives their life, how the foolish man or the wise man looks at leadership. But number three, how the foolish man or the, rich, or the wisdom man, a <laughs> wise man, uh, leads a labor life. I like the L's this morning. So how you live your life, how you look at leadership and how you lead a labor life, a labor life. Well, check it out. Solomon's gonna talk about how you work is whether you're a fool or not. He ascribes that in verse eight. He says, he that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. Whoso breaketh a hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Whoso removeth stones shall be hurt therewith. And he that cleaveth wood or choppeth wood shall be endangered thereby. If the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength. But wisdom is profitable to direct. Wisdom is profitable to direct. Some of your newer translations, I think the new King Jimmy says, wisdom uh, brings success or something like that. Is that right? Wisdom brings success. What is he saying here? You might be confused because he's talking rhetorically first by saying, man, if you dig a ditch, you're gonna fall into it. If you trim the hedge, a serpent will jump out and bite you. If you try to lift a stone, you'll break your back and hurt yourself. If you're chopping wood, you'll be injured. And what's he saying? Is he saying you shouldn't dig a ditch, trim a hedge, chop wood? No, he's being sarcastic in a way by saying, the, the, the foolish man says, oh, I can't do work. 
Why can't you do work? Well, if I dig a ditch, I might fall into it. That's what he's saying. If I trim the hedge, a snake might come out and bite me. Do you guys know people like that? There's an excuse as to why they can't work and there's an excuse every day, some new excuse of why they can't get the, work do- the job done. That's the fool. The foolish man, the foolish woman doesn't have a work ethic. But the wise man will sharpen his ax. See, that's the language there that I, I kind of love it there uh, where he's talking about, you know, when you're chopping the wood, if the iron, verse 10, or the ax head, or the splitting maul, you know, be blunt, then he do not wet the edge. Now the wet, the edge means to sharpen it. Um, then he must put the more strength. It takes more work to do it, but to work with wisdom is to sharpen the edge of the, of the bl- a blade, you know? Now, there's an old story that's kind of fun is um, um, an old logger was there and some young guy said, hey, I want a job. And he said, listen, if, if you can chop this tree down over here um, faster than me, then you have the job. And the guy looked at the old man and said, okay. And uh, they got their axes out and uh, started chopping away. And the old man just kind of was leisurely swinging the ax. And even the old man would sit down and lean up against a tree once in a while and take a breather. And, but the young man, he had the energy and the strength and he just kept going and going. Um, and there were several trees that they had to chop that day and they went from tree to tree and all day, just chopping, chopping, chopping. And if the young man could keep up with the old man, he had the job. Well, by the end of the day, the young man was just tuckered out. He'd been chopping all day and the old man, he, he was fairly rested because he took, he took these moments to sit down and the young man finally came and said, how are you doing this? You're chopping more trees than me. And you even took rests. He said, oh, you make a mistake. I wasn't resting, I was sharpening my ax. And see, that's what this scripture is saying. You can sit there and flail and try to work. Some people think that's wisdom, but that's not. The wise person works, but keeping their ax sharp, doing it wisely. This is, this is sort of the mark of the wise man versus the foolish man. Uh, so the, the foolish man says, I'm not even gonna chop wood because it's dangerous. Boy, I, I worry about our culture. We're, we're so into safety. Um, like you can't do anything anymore. Uh, it's kind of amazing. Uh, you know, the things that have changed uh, are so, I mean, there's so much that I did. There's, I'm gonna say 90% of what I did as a child, they would, they would not even allow children to do it anymore. Um, my parents probably would have been arrested uh, for allowing me to run a chainsaw as, as an eight-year-old boy. And, you know, me and my neighbor riding our dirt bikes way up into the mountains and camping out and eating crawdads from the, crook, uh, the creek there and, uh, you know, cooking them up. And, um, you know, uh, we, we used to carry our, you know, our little, you know, rifles on our shoulder as we're walking down the street because, uh, you know, you never know when there's something that needs to be shot. Um, <laughs> like, like, this is the way we grew up. Uh, but today you'd go to jail for all this stuff. But man, we, we're, we're so you know, safe and you know, I never put a helmet on my head until I was like a teenager on a dirt bike. And for years I rode dirt bikes without a helmet. Like that's, that's, that explains a lot, uh, maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I remember the dashboard on my, uh, my parents' vehicles. They were never you know, padded you know, dashboards with big balloons that popped out when you, you know, crashing today is almost fun. It's like poof, poof. Oh, it was like awesome. Um, the, the airbags and stuff. Man, our, our, our dashboards were just solid metal. Um, if you crashed, you were taking metal samples with your face. You say, Brett, are those better days than today? I don't know. But I, I, do, I do wonder, you know, some of us are, have become so foolish that we're unwilling to do anything. We've almost paralyzed ourselves because of things we're afraid of. Um, and, and that's kind of what he's saying here. Man, you're afraid to do some work because you might fall in the ditch, get bit by a snake, hurt yourself chopping wood, or hurt your back by lifting the rocks. He said, no, do the work. The wise person will sharpen their edge of their, you know, their cutting implement and get the work done. And that's where success is found. That's where wisdom is found. Lead a labor life. By the way, this is the same Solomon who, if you recall, remember we did that sermon a few months back about this, Proverbs 6, 6. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Remember that? Consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide over her, uh, uh, provides her meat in the summer and gathers food in the harvest. How long will thou sleep, O sluggard? 
When will you arise out of sleep? Yet a little sleep and a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth and thy want as an armed man. Poverty comes to the fool who just sits, oh, just a little more sleep, a little more slumber. Any of you guys watched Sesame Street when you were a kid? Remember Ernie and Bert? Um, this is before they were all politically correct and everything, but Ernie and Bert, um, the one thing I always remember, when I read this as a kid, a little more sleep and a little more slumber. I remember, remember when Ernie and Bert would be trying to go to sleep and um, I think Ernie, what, no, was it Bert or Ernie that was always talking and the other one was trying to go to sleep? But they'd be laying in their bed and then they'd be, you know, and he wouldn't let the other guy go to sleep. But they'd have those little fingers and they would, they would fold their fingers like this and they would, they would sit there and do this while they're, you know, trying to go to sleep and then he'd say something, and, ah, you know, like that. But, but that's the image that I have when I see this. A little folding of the hands, a little, just a little more sleep, a little more, wake up thou sluggard. That, that's some of you, hopefully not, because that's the foolish, but oh, just a little more sleep. Are you Ernie and Bert? That's the question. <laughs> well, all that to say, that's what Solomon's saying. He's saying to lead a labor life. Well, one more uh, out of these things that he's using as a litmus test. How the foolish man and the wise man live their life, look at leadership, how they lead a labor life, but thirdly, fourthly, pardon me, how they legislate their lips. How they legislate their lips, what do you mean? Do you have a guard over your mouth? Do you set a law around your mouth or do you just let it rip? Um, listen to what he says about the foolish man and his lips here in verse 11. He says in verse 11, surely the serpent will bite without enchantment and a babbler is no better. A babbler is a King James way of saying a person who just talks on and on and on. It doesn't come up for air. Verse 12, the words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. It's like he'll put his foot in his mouth is the idea there. Verse 13, the beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness and the end of his talk is mischievous madness. A fool also is full of words. A man cannot tell what shall be and what shall be after him. Who can tell him? The labor of the foolish wearieth every one of them because he knoweth not how to go into the city. What's he saying here? The foolish guy just doesn't give up. He just keeps talking and talking and never knows anything, never learns anything, just keeps babbling on. The wise man, well, the idea is his words are fewer, but also when he does speak words, it says here, verse 12, the words of the wise man's mouth are gracious, kind, good words. Foolish man or wise man, how are you with your mouth? Solomon says, this is the litmus test. You're either a fool or you are wise. Hmm. One of the things that Solomon really camps out on is you know, keeping your mouth shut, slow to speak. Um, that's a hard one, isn't it? Especially for those of us that do a lot of talking. Uh, it gets you into trouble. Um, there's safety and quietness. I've never regretted something I didn't say but I sure have regretted things I've said. Do you remember Proverbs 17, 28? It reminds me of this one. Uh, it says, even a fool when he holds his peace is counted wise. <laughs> even a fool, if he's not saying anything, people are, ah, that's wise. He's a wise person. And he that shuts his lips is esteemed as a man of understanding. It's like that old saying, you know, better to keep your mouth shut and have people think you're a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. I remember, you know, when, uh, it's funny how the beauty pageants have kind of gone by the wayside. Not so, so sad about that in some ways, but um, you know, uh, the reason why, the funniest part to me was when everybody interviewed the pageantry uh, ladies, you know, um, and some of the answers, whoo, you know, they're walking around very classy, very elegant, and then the question, what do you feel about euthanasia? Well, I care about all children and youth in Australia, youth in Africa, youth in, oh, yeah, that's us. As soon as we open our mouths, we give ourselves away as, well, fools. That's what, that's what Solomon's saying. The wise man will keep his mouth closed, but if he does open his mouth, gracious words. Wouldn't it be great if you and I, if we became 
really good at speaking gracious words? Like if that was our thing? You see, this is where I kind of land this thing um, on this Sunday morning because, you know, we talked about Solomon being the wisest man that walked the face of the earth, but I said, except for one, and that is Jesus. And Jesus modeled perfect wisdom. And when I compare Jesus to these four pieces of test, the litmus test, man, it makes me marvel at Jesus, our Messiah. Jesus, the first one, how did he live his life? Um, Did he stink? Did he have problems? Did he live his life and do questionable things? The answer is no. They said of Jesus, oh, he doeth all things well. Speaking of Jesus's fragrance, I love that story there in, you know, in the gospel of John where in John chapter 12, um, you know, Mary broke that beautiful, precious ointment and Jesus had it on his feet. And the whole room, the Bible says the whole house was filled with the fragrance. I love that, man. There was a sweet smelling savor in the house because of Jesus. That was the, the way he rolled. He was, he was not the fool that had the fly in the ointment. There was no fly there, no sin, nothing that marred him. And because of that, people, people marveled at how he lived his life. How did Jesus look at leadership, number two? Well, who could be over Jesus? Well, this is the mystery of the Trinity, isn't it? Because Jesus would say over and over again, he'd say stuff like this, I always do the will of who? The Father. Jesus was submitted to the Father. Well, isn't he the one and the same? Oh man, the the discussion of the Holy Trinity, we've done whole sermons on that and it's a mystery, I'll I'll give it to you. And we do take it by faith. But what's interesting about it is I have no question, Jesus was taken out of time and space. God, Emmanuel, God became flesh and lived among us, the Bible says. John chapter one tells us that. And Jesus, in in a way, making himself of no reputation, putting upon himself the form of a servant, being in the likeness of men. See, that's the thing, he turned himself into a man, which makes him suddenly, not exactly like God the Father, which is omnipotent, omnipresent. Even Jesus said, it's good that I'm gonna leave you because I'm gonna leave my Holy Spirit and my comforter to be with you. I can't be everywhere at once, the idea is what Jesus is saying. Jesus limited himself. So the limited version is the one we saw when he walked in Galilee and in Jerusalem. But what's amazing about Jesus, even making himself of no reputation, he, he did that and, and it gave for us the model of how to be submitted to authority. Because Jesus even submitted to authority. Man, there's several places in Jesus's life where he submitted to authority, which is interesting. We could talk about when Jesus would you know, say, I'd always do the will of the Father, that one's easy. But what about paying taxes? Did Jesus submit to that authority? Yeah, remember they asked him about paying taxes. Render unto Caesar, what's Caesar? Whose picture's on the coin? Um, and they even paid their tax. Remember when Peter got the fish with the coin in it? Like they, Jesus submitted to authority. It's an amazing thing. In fact, it's interesting because the next one goes along with that, um, you know, lead a labor life. Did Jesus work? Well, he was a carpenter, carpenter's son. I have no doubt Jesus was a worker. And we know that he labored in teaching the, the multitudes um, and even would weary himself by you know, going and, and, and healing the sick and traveling the countryside, ministering to people. But the ultimate work Jesus did, of course, was the work of the cross. He led a labored life and labored on the cross for you and me. Did he legislate his lips? Did he uh, hold his tongue? Man, if anyone in the world could have ever let people have it with their lips, Jesus could have. Jesus could have easily just told everybody a thing or two. And if Jesus gives you a piece of his mind, you're in huge trouble. But what's amazing is he would even do that. In fact, I'm reminded there of, you know, um, when Jesus legislated his lips in Matthew 27, verse 11, it says this. And Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him saying, art thou king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests, the elders, he answered nothing and then said Pontius Pilate unto him, don't you hear now how many things these witnesses say against thee? And Jesus answered him to never a word insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. They marveled. Why won't you say something in your own defense? We know what Jesus was doing. He was willingly going to the cross 
for you and for me, doing the work of salvation. And he legislated his lips. If there was ever a time somebody should have spoke up technically, that would have been it. Jesus was innocent, but he didn't. He kept his tongue and man, that's the perfect model. Jesus is our model, his fragrance, his submission to leadership, his work on the cross, his control of his lips. And, and, and probably the best thing, remember how Solomon said, you know, the wise man, his mouth, his words are what? Gracious. What did they say of Jesus's word? Luke chapter four, verse 22. It says, and all bear him witness. They all saw Jesus and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? This is the carpenter's son. But listen to his gracious words. I love that Solomon says that the personification of wisdom is when a wise man speaks gracious words. Jesus was the champ of that. His words were gracious. And so what this does for me is I have to ask myself, do I speak gracious words or do I speak harsh words? If I speak harsh words, I'm a fool. Am I one who legislates my lips or let people have it with my lips? Foolish. Am I one who's leading a labored life and sharpening my ax and doing the work? That's the wise man. Am I looking for reasons to procrastinate and not do the work? Why procrastinate today when you can procrastinate tomorrow? <laughs> Are you Ernie and Bert? That's the fool. Look at leadership. Do I not like authority? Do I not like when people say, hey, man, you need to knock that off or you need to stop doing that or somebody coming in and giving you a word, someone who's an authority over you and you rebel, you're a fool, Solomon says. But if you're one who listens to that authority and submits yourself to that authority, you're a wise man, wise woman. And how you live your life, do you let the fly stick in the ointment and cause your life to stink? That's a fool. And, and sad about that, the sad thing about that one is you're the last one to know. Well, thanks a lot, Pastor Brett. I think you just called us a fool this morning. Hey, I've got some good news. I think we're all fools. I think we're all fools, that's the bad news. The good news is, how far away are you from being back into the wisdom category? That's the beautiful thing about Jesus and his work on the cross is he moves you from fool back to wise real quick. How does he do that? Forgiveness. If we confess our sins to the Lord, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Man, I hope you understand the power of the cross to, to save us for sure, but also to, to cleanse us, to wash us, to give us a clean slate and a brand new start. And maybe you, like me, maybe we've all done some foolish things and we've got marks on our record and we've behaved badly and we've rebelled against authority and we've done this or that or the other. But good news, we can just repent right now, confess our sin to the Lord and start fresh today. And man, you can walk out of here back in the wisdom category. Does anybody want that? Man, I do, I need that. That's why I think it'd be good for us here in Westland, but also you guys in Salem and Sherwood, for us to go to the table of communion and for us to finish off today's study with the Lord's table. So at this time, I'm gonna have Joey come up and lead us in a couple songs. And uh, we'll, we'll let's, let's just offer a little prayer and then we'll all together as a church go to the table in communion. Lord, we're so thankful that you have done the work for us. We confess, Lord, that human nature uh, equals foolishness. We do foolish things. We've walked contrary to you. We've led our lives in a direction toward weakness. We've done things that only make us weaker. Lord, there's so many things that we do really that Solomon mentions here. And it's troubling if, if we didn't know the end of the story. How thankful we are, Lord, for the forgiveness of sin and new life, old things passed away, all things become new. How thankful we are that you take our sins and put them on the cross, dying for us, dealing with the penalty of our sin. Lord, if there be anyone who's listening or watching or tuning in today here, who has yet to know you and believe or be saved, I pray that they would confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that you died on the cross, was buried, then rose up from the grave and ascended to heaven. Lord, just to believe the gospel that the death on the cross was for us. Lord, may everyone accept that and receive that. 
So we do come to your table humbly, thankfully. We take the bread and remember your body it was broken and bruised, beaten for us. We take the cup remembering the innocent blood that was shed in our place. Our blood should have been flowing. Yours flowed instead. How thankful we are for the work of the cross. So meet us here as we go to the table of communion. We, we don't do this out of ritual. We do this as a personal relationship with you, being thankful for what you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together. If you're not sure if you're a Christian and you wanna go to the communion table, you know you're a sinner. Hey, I wanna remind you, you can be saved. Uh, there's gonna be a couple pastors over in the prayer room right now. And instead of going to the communion table right away, what if you went over and said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna accept Christ and I'm gonna confess Jesus as my savior. Um, man, they'd love to pray with you. And then you can go to the table of communion and not just going through some religious motion, it's actually a reality in your life. And you can eat and drink and remember what Jesus did for you. So that's available. But there's communion tables in the front and in the back and on the sides. And just as Joey leads us in a couple songs before we pack it up, um, you can just make your way, take those elements and, and then just take them back and, and just seek the Lord. Take time, confess your sin. Let's meet the Lord together in Jesus' name.